Hi pals! Welcome back to Page vs. Screen, where I take a look at stories that have been adapted from the written word to the silver and small screens to see if anything on the screen can be better than what was done on the page. Today, we've come across the White Rabbit again and have followed him all the way back to Lewis Carroll's Wonderland and Looking Glass World. The format is simple. I tell you about what the film versions did great and what made me go... Curious, huh? I look at how accurate it is, if any changes made sense, and how entertaining I found it to determine which did it better, the page or the screen. A good chunk of the populace is probably already familiar with elements of the two books, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. If you're not and are expecting the usual three minute download, you'll need to check out part one, aka the edition, because this is the curiouser and curiouser edition, picking up the rankings from where I left off forever ago in part one. Well, kinda. I mean, in that video, I ended it at number 22, and technically, number 21 isn't suitable for public YouTube, so I talked about that one in an exclusive member video. And if I'm saying it's not good for public YouTube, because I will drop that bombs. Um, it, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> but since it's been forever and day, since the first installment of Alice movies, here is a quick rundown of the rank listings from number 31 to 21. Number 31, Alice to the Looking Glass, directed by Andrea Bresciani and Richard Slapczynski in 1987. Tied at number 29, that Girl in Wonderland, directed by Jules Pass in 1973, and Alice in Wonderland in Paris, directed by Jean Deitch in 1966. 28, Funky Alice, voice directed, because I couldn't find any other director, by Doug Parker in 1991. Number 27, Alice in Wonderland, directed by Richard Trueblood in 1988. Number 26, Alice in Wonderland, the Dutch version, I couldn't find a director or a year of release for this one. Number 25, um, let's see if I can remember how to say this properly. Alice Ula Denier? No, wait. Okay, hold on. Pause here! Okay. Okay. All right. So, back to the rankings. Number 25, Alice ou la dernière fugue. Yeah. <laughs> Directed by Claude Chabrol, Chabrol in 1977. Number 24, Alice in Wonderland. Directed by Barry Letts in 1986. 23, Alice's Wonderland. Directed by Walt Disney at Laugh-O-Gram Films in 1923. Number 22, Alice in Wonderland, directed by Jonathan Miller in 1966. And <laughs> one, Malice in Wonderland, directed by Vincent Collins in 1982. Last time, it was the worst adaptations of the 31 I could find. This time, it's the ones that were good, but not as good as the book. So let's leave Dinah Kitty and Snowdrop behind and visit our old friends again. One note, I am back to the original ranking systems I used because when I first set the Alice stuff up, I did it on the numbered rankings. So if you go back and check out my last two page versus screens, I went with the tiered ranking and that'll be what I continue to do for anything else after I'm done with the Alice videos. Okay, let's go. We start the continuation with the 1949 version at number 20. This version I found was restored and released in the 90s by Kids Classics Home Videos. Apparently they did more than just Bible stories. <laughs> and as for the company spelling of their name, I'm surprised that they, did, that they didn't go full 90s by calling it Kids Classics. Alright, so the first 15 minutes of this one was how Charles Dodgson, aka Lewis Carroll, worked at Oxford and his littles and the Wonderland characters were characters of caricatures of people like Queen Victoria, etc, etc. It was super dry. If you decide you want to watch this movie and you want to get to the actual story, you can skip the first bit. 
Also, side note, the whole caricature and analogy thing is just one theory about the story. I've also heard that he was so pissed about the newer mathematical processes and such that he wrote Wonderland and Looking Glass as his rant against theological nature. I mean, he didn't have Instagram reels or TikTok to turn to, so really, what else was he supposed to do? Regardless, it could have been the caricatures, it could have been the mass thing, it could have been both. I don't know. But yeah, anyways. This movie is a combo claymation live-action musical. Not too shabby. I'm a little sad they cut out the caterpillar section. It's not the only section they cut out. But, I mean, it's one of my favorite parts. So it's a little sad. At least for me. <laughs> they did include the bit that normally happens during the croquet match. But they cut out the croquet match. and had a dance sequence that was the lobster quadrille instead. But then they did include the debate from the book during the croquet match between the King of Hearts, the Queen of Hearts, and their executioner about the Cheshire Cat's head floating in the sky. I mean, that's one of the things that's cut out most of the time. So it's pretty neat to see it actually being included for once. Like, yes. <laughs> A weird thing that they did include, though, was the griffin making an appearance. They cut out the mock turtle scene. The main purpose is to take Alice to the mock turtle. Now, it also includes the lobster quadrille, but how they included the dance actually made sense, so okay, that's cool. But since they cut out the mock turtle, the griffin? Oh, well, he lost all real purpose and reason to be there, and I don't know if you know how long it takes to film stop-motion claymation. Well, any stop-motion anything, really. But it takes at least 12 shots to get one second's worth of footage and have it be relatively smooth. And a relatively smooth out animation sequence. I mean, depending on how many things are moving in that shot, it can take a while to move things before you take your next picture for that scene. Like, it takes a ridiculously long time to do. So they cut out the mock turtle stuff and included the griffin just for this. Lazy thing! <laughs> That just felt like a waste of production time considering how long it would have taken to not only create the model, but then film everything. It, but yeah, it just, it, it made no sense for this version. <laughs> and with all the extra work, I would go into it just for that. Overall, it was okay, but some of the choices they made just felt off to me, and I couldn't get past that. Now we go further back to 1933 for number 19 and Betty Boop in Betty in Blunderland. It was definitely inspired by the books. It includes characters from both of them, but the plot wasn't the same. Like, okay, yes, she does follow the white rabbit. She goes through the looking glass and then down the rabbit hole, where the entrance is the subway station in the woods. But then they go straight into the garden, where she sings a song, a few of the Wonderland denizens do some dancing, and then they're all attacked by the Jabberwocky, who came out of the Hatter's Hat, and they fight it. It's something to note that the Jabberwocky is just a poem in the books. It's not an actual character. But it crops up once in a while as something more than just a poem in adaptations. So really, not much of anything of the plots of the books, but a good deal of the characters are seen. There were a couple of fun nods that stuck out to me. The first being how she got into the garden, because it's still a tiny door that she has to get through. And so instead of going all over the place, they have her drink a shrinkola to get through the door. The other thing is the Hatter's Top Hat. Normally it's shown in visual arts with a card stating 10 and 6. But this one has been updated for an American audience, and it says 98 cents on it. Now, I don't know if that's really what 10 and 6 would have been back then, but it was still fun. Overall, the changes did fit with the boob aesthetic. Plus, it was less than 7 minutes long, so they only had song to tell a story. And it was entertaining. Next, we have, tied for number 17, two entries. One of which is an international entry. It's also the last one of the international ones, because we've had ones from possibly Japan, and Australia, and the Netherlands, at least I'm assuming the Netherlands, because they're speaking Dutch, and France. This one comes from, as it was known then, Czechoslovakia. It's 1988's Nietzsche ze Elenki. Apologize if I fucked up the pronunciation. Okay, so, first off, I didn't speak the language at all, okay? I know of, of Cyrillic languages, I know how to say home in Russian, uh, if I remember, house, house or home in Russian, which is like, 
if I recall correctly, is Domo. And I know how to say wait in Ukrainian. It's Chikai, 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 wait, 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 wait. Oh, and of course, Pasenki. But, like, <laughs> aside from that, I am the worst Ukrainian because I know, like, none of the goddamn language. <laughs> but that's, like, the most I know of any Cyrillic language. So, yeah, when there was somebody speaking, which wasn't a whole lot in this movie, I had no idea what was going on, like, from, from the words. It was like that with the French one, and so I had to use visual cues to keep track of the story. Also, this one, you know, if you really want to watch it high, I mean, I wasn't, I, I don't, but, and I'm seriously not saying that as a challenge to people that do get high, it's just, it's crazy enough when you're sober. Okay, so, actual things about what happens in this movie and how it was done. It focuses on the first book alone. I didn't really see anything that I think could make it to Through the Looking Glass, and it was done as a combo live-action stop animation type thing. Uh, there are only two living people in it, and one, Alice's sister, is really only there for the first few minutes, and she's not the focus. You don't even see her face. It's only Alice for real people otherwise, and everything else of the main story was done as stop animation around her. Well, except when she shrinks down. Then she's turned into a small doll, and at those points, Alice is stop animationed. Is that a real word? I don't know. Whatever. It is now. And this happens a few times. But then we get this guy. Yeah, this taxidermied weirdo is the White Rabbit. And these guys are our Matt Hatter and March Hare. To add to this, once Alice follows the White Rabbit down the rabbit hole, or rather into a drawer, because she initially follows it into a drawer, and then eventually gets knocked down a dumbwaiter, so I'm not sure if the drawer is supposed to be part of the rabbit hole parallel, but the dumbwaiter is for sure. <laughs> anyway, back to the point, she follows the white rabbit into a drawer and ends up in a burrow-type place where we're shown the white rabbit eating witch hangs, only to find out but he's not stuffed with fluffins. He's stuffed with wood shavings. His meal is his innards. What? There are so many things in this movie that would be considered creepy and or weird by a Western audience back then and even now. I can't even get into it all. But just from that, I hope you'll understand why I say this movie is creepy as fuck, because it only gets weirder as it goes along. And I'll say it again, don't watch it high. Even for the fully sober viewer, you are wondering if somebody slipped you something. Even if you are watching it alone, you're wondering if somebody somehow slipped you something. Okay? Despite the creepy factor, it's quite accurate in its way, and you can see that most of the scenes have parallels to the book. We get the fall down the rabbit hole, the stuff where she grows, shrinks, and cries, the stuff with the white rabbit's house featuring a moment that made me think, here's Bunny! Of the caterpillar, the Duchess makes an appearance. Tea party, croquet match, trial, most of the big things with some additions like a scene where she's forced into some liquid, makes her grow, but instead of becoming a girl again, she's a giant doll, and then she's paralyzed in a room with cockroaches and food, and it's just. <laughs> so this movie had some weird and creepy elements, but, um, Aside from the cockroach bit, it was also strangely entertaining. I can't say this is what all movies and shows were like in that area of the world back then, like, for, like, the weird factor, obviously. But I can't understand, based on what I've heard from somebody who actually lived in the area, why the production was done the way it was done. If you're interested in checking out what some cinema was like at that point in that time, in that area of the world, say, take a look at it. Even if you don't understand the language, you can follow along. Like, it's fine. For what it's tied within the rankings, though, we go from exceptionally weird to exceptionally wholesome with a Mickey's Clubhouse episode called Mickey's Adventures in Wonderland. So if you don't already know, Mickey's Clubhouse is meant for toddlers. Ah, so that's the audience it's catering to. The show has puzzles. Well, I'm assuming that every episode has puzzles for the kids to do along with the show, like in this one. This is the only episode ever seen, so it's my only point of reference. But it seems like something the show would regularly have. In this one, they do things like teach kids how to read the hands on an analog clock and figure out shapes, you know, stuff like that. It's good for the kiddos. They did make some changes. Instead of having Mickey and Donald who needed to get through the small door, well, instead of having them drink random stuff that said, drink me, they were miniaturized by shrinking sparkles made by Dr. Von Drake. Well, I assume he made them. I mean, you know, 
<laughs> he's an inventor. But I'm not going to fault them for that change. I mean, we get to what they were trying to do without possibly having kids drink random stuff to see if they shrink or grow. So, yeah. Some parents just might have to deal with random glitter around their home, depending on how into playing pretend their kids get. And let's be real, if they already have glitter in their house and kids, well, that shit's like herpes. It never really goes away, so they're already dealing with glitter for the rest of their lives anyways. Seriously, her herpes is a craft world. But I digress. Minnie has her garden of white roses, but she doesn't try to paint them red or anything and doesn't get upset that they're not red, so I don't really get why they had her with that part of things, but whatever. We have Goofy as the Mad Hatter stand-in, and they play musical chairs, which I thought was a fun little nod to Queen. Things move down, move down. <laughs> he also pulls some stuff out of his hat. A dog, a pig, and a frog. All of which are in the first book. So that was a fun little thing, too. And whether or not it was intentional, I had no idea. It was fun regardless. And Mickey and Donald have to get out of Wonderland by playing some croquet. One thing I was a little surprised by was that they didn't use any of the Disney depictions of Wonderland characters since they did the animated version in 1951. So they could have done it, like, no problem. It's all of their IP. So, yeah. But, you know, the House of Mouse, it's gonna do what's gonna do. Side note, when did Daisy get a ponytail? And how? She's a duck. Ducks don't have hair, and feathers don't really work that way. Anyways, it was cute. Considering their intended audience, the changes mostly made sense. And it had some nods to the original story. We throw back to 1966 to wonder, what's a nice kid like you? Doing in a place like this. It's a Hanna-Barbera production, so she goes through various areas of the story, but with a Hanna-Barbera musical twist. Like the Caterpillar. It's Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble in a costume that's a two-headed caterpillar, and they're in showbiz. Cheshire is a cool jazz cat voiced by Sammy Davis Jr. who sings the theme song. And it's definitely a combination of the two books, because not only do we have those characters, we have the White Knight with his useless items, but the rabbit is always running late, though he also loves games, and we have both the Mad Hatter and Hatta, we play on Hatta, the Hatter. Hatta, uh, one of the White Knight's messengers, or not White Knight, the White King's messengers in the book, is shown in drawings in Through the Looking Glass as Mad Hatter, but they're different characters in the book so far as I know. Huh? <laughs> But yeah, that was cool. In Wonderland, the trial scene is silly, but this is a Hanna-Barbera world. So it was especially silly. So it was actually, in my opinion, more silly than the books. But for the Hanna-Barbera setting, that kind of worked. She ends up getting chased after she, Humphrey Dumpty, who loves good egg puns, which tracks with the character in Through the Looking Glass, because he's got a thing about words, and also the White Rabbit, who have, they've all been arrested. Alice's motivation isn't getting to a beautiful garden, though. It's all about finding her dog, Fluff. There are a couple of blatant nods to the author and his work, and not with characters or places. She's supposed to be working on a book report about the Wonderland books, and they've got a book where this book randomly shows up, opens to a page that reads, This place is alright in my book, and is supposed to have been written by Lewis Carroll. So yeah, fun little reference. It's mildly accurate, more so than you'd think when you realize it's more inspired by the books rather than being a straight adaptation, but most of the characters are pretty true to their page counterparts, and a couple of the things from the book are touched on. So yeah, it gets the number 16 slapped. Number 15 brings us to 2016's Alice Through the Looking Glass, the live-action Disney sequel to their live-action remake of Alice in Wonderland, a la Tim Burke. Like the first one, it's inspired by the world created by Carol, and so it incorporates things from both books instead of just the one it's named after. I don't really have a lot to say about this one. Um, there were some fun nods, like Humpty Dumpty getting pushed off a table and the White King's men go to put him back together. Uh, there was a portrait with a pig. I'm not sure if that was a reference to the baby to pig thing with the Duchess or if that was just some random thing they included. I don't know. They did have more than just things labeled eat or drink me. There was also a chain that said pull me, which was a fun addition and in theme with things established in the original story. But then they had this guy. I'm <laughs> sorry. This guy. No, no, no. Damn it. That's Rassilon. Him. Shit. No. This guy. Him. This is time. 
he's got a romance going with the Red Queen and it's kind of weird and that's saying something considering it's Wonderland. But he's in charge of making sure that time keeps flowing and holds the pocket watches of life of everybody in Wonderland. I don't know if they're actually called the pocket watches of life, but that's what I'm calling them. When Alice shows up, he's got in his head that she wants to steal what's called the chronosphere. It's a time machine. It's like a time, time sphere. And while she is there to ask to use it, she literally just wants to borrow it. But instead of saying no, he's a massive douche about it and goes on about her wanting to... Poloin it. This does actually lead to her stealing it. Self-fulfilling prophecy, party of one. And then we get the rest of the movie. If it wasn't made clear before, I think it's got massive Time Lord vibes. Like, the Doctor and the Master are not the only Time Lords that got cut off from the Gallifrey after the Time War and was in that little time bubble thing. Maybe he was on the council that forced two to regenerate into three and he's all obsessed with people not stealing Time Lord tech. Maybe that's it, but he should have known better. Since the Doctor gave him the old two-finger salute and stole the TARDIS anyway, and he should have totally seen a repeat of somebody stealing his chronosphere to do what they felt they needed to do. I'm not saying I condone theft. I'm just saying he should have totally seen that coming. Though I did enjoy the time puns. That was good. I love me a good pun. But they took a different take with the whole who's full of hearts thing. I did like that. Uh, when the White Queen and Red Queens were kids, there was an incident where the White Queen ate tarts that she wasn't supposed to that sent their lives on a whole big spiral to where they are in the present. I mean, it's this whole ridiculous thing from when they were kids, but, you know, some people can hold a grudge. It was mildly entertaining, and like I said, it had some nods and interesting takes on established events in the books. And of course, it gave us this. Just like fire. Which is one of my favorite songs. I mean, according to YouTube, it was one of my top played songs of 2022, so, you know. Anyways, moving on to number 14. In this place, we have the 1931 version. This one looks like it was trying to recreate segments of the book fairly faithfully, but instead of Alice being a little girl, she's portrayed as an adult. When we get later in the movie, this change makes sense, and we'll get to why in a bit, but it just kind of sucks because... She was annoying, just, ugh. But, like, it was pretty accurate for the sections they kept in the movie. Some of the things were shuffled around. I can't remember if I said this in part one, but that was a very long time ago, so I'll just refresh your memory. The chapters are done in an episodic nature, where if you took each chapter as its own standalone thing, you can shuffle most of the chapters around without hurting anything. The only exceptions would be the chapters where she enters Wonderland and Looking Glass World, the croquet match and trial in the first book, and her becoming a queen and the feast in the second book. Pretty much anything else can be reordered to your heart's content, and you're still good. Just the occasional transition may have to be altered, which isn't a biggie in the grand scheme of things. But after falling down the rabbit hole, they chopped out most of the first bit of Wonderland stuff, except her having the White Rabbit's fan and gloves. Then she's at the Duchess's, and after that we get most of the chapters. It did feel a little weird, them chopping the earlier stuff, since that's what's kept in when it's more of a true adaptation and not simply inspired by the world of Wonderland. But they also took out the size-changing stuff throughout. Like, that just feels like quintessential Wonderland lore, so it felt super weird to exclude that. And they had a dance number in the croquet match. I mean, maybe the 1949 writers got the idea to do that from this one. I can't say for sure, but there have been crazier things in the world. This change didn't feel weird overall. I thought it worked, like in the 49 version. Most of the dialogue was on point to what was in the book, and where things deviated from the original story. Well, guess what? They fixed the dialogue to match the changes! But that's made me happy. I've said it before. If you're doing dialogue straight from the book, and you've made changes to the story... Update the dialogue. Otherwise, it's shit. So yes, thank you 1931 writers for not fucking that up. Thank you. There is a touch of romance in this adaptation. No, there's no full-on smooches or anything like that, but during the trial, the knave is going, yes, I would have stolen the tarts for you and implying that he loves her. But this is why I'm glad they made Alice a grown woman, even if she's dressed in more child-appropriate attire. It would have been super creepy to make that insinuation if they were played by a kid. After a bit, 
The Queen of Hearts ends up telling the knave that he has to marry the Duchess as a punishment, which the White Rabbit doesn't like, because then he says that he stole the tarts. I guess he wanted that punishment instead. Even Alice speculates on whether he's in love with the Duchess or not. I think it's because he doesn't fess up whether guilty or not until after the Queen sentences the knave, and there's just little bits earlier in the movie where he's going on about the Duchess. Pity King of the White Rabbit. Why is it, if any character or costume design is going to be in the nightmare fuel category, it's the White Rabbits? I mean, let's just let's give a quick refresh of our Czech friend. Okay, okay, yes, you remember now? Okay, well, this is the 1939, sorry, 1931 White Rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just rock me to sleep tonight, because that's going to be stuck in my dreams for a while. All in all, it was an interesting one, and mostly in line with the events of the book, so that's why I gave it the number 14 spot. Now the lucky number 13. We have to go far back in time, over 100 years ago, to 1903. This is, so far as I know, the earliest film version of Alice in Wonderland. It's about nine minutes long, because movies weren't very long in the 20, early 20th century, sorry, so only so much could be included in it, which, you know, fair enough. It was interesting to see what they kept and what they cut, considering the film was so precious back then. An aspect that's cut from most of the movies is where she's in a garden. Not the garden that she's trying to get to, that she saw while she was in the Hall of Doors, because that's where the cocaine match happens, but just a random garden, and she comes across a puppy that's massive, because, you know, she's still shrunk down. They actually included that in this one. Honestly, of all the parts of the books, this section doesn't offer much, and like I said, it's typically cut, probably for that reason. I'd love to be able to ask them why they kept it in, though. Actually, I'd like to talk to them in general, but we'll get to that in a bit. They kept the Hall of Doors bit, but cut out the part where she cries a river. I'd assume because they cut out the part with the mouse and the caucus race. So what's the point of that? But it's still one of those things where you're like, hmm. But also, look at this footage. Look how seamless that was. Like, it was so cool. <laughs> I might have to do a video on that technique. I mean, if I can get it done in time, I think it's going to be the member's companion video to this, because, I mean, why not? I have the perfect excuse to link shit together and to actually look at how they did this way back in the day when you couldn't just type a few things or click a couple of buttons on a screen and have an algorithm do it for you. It's so cool, and I am well impressed. I have started researching the topic and have already learned a little bit not how it was done yet. Like, seriously, this is this is why another reason why I would love to go and talk to the people that made the movie. <sighs> Again, this one is short, so I don't really have a lot to say about it in comparison to other versions, although there are two things that really annoyed me in it. One, and I know this is super nitpicky, but they have it where the Cheshire Cat tells her that the tea party is at the Hatters at a double check, but it's at the March Hares. Again, I know, I know. Super nitpicky, but, you know. And for whatever reason, if they're going to increase the presence between either the hair or the hatter, they seem to always have the hatter's importance a little higher when they're really pretty equal to each other. It happens in the Tim Burton live-action remakes where he's her bestie. It happens in at least one of the entries that's coming from part three. I don't remember seeing the hair in the Betty Boop one, but the hatter definitely has a more prominent role in that one. I wish I knew that why they did that. But maybe it all stems from this version where they say it's the Hatter's place and that just kind of stuck in the general consciousness of society, like some sort of weird Mandela effect. I don't know, but it's annoying. Future filmmakers, let's give the hair some love. Enough of the Hatter. He has had his time to shine. Anyway, the second thing that annoyed me is they took out the, the trial and the caterpillars part. Like I said before, the caterpillar scene is one of my favorites from the first book, and another one is the trial. Instead of the trial, she accidentally offends the Queen of Hearts somehow. No idea what was said or done. And then she wants Alice executed. Alice then boxes the executioner's ears, and in the confusion, she wakes up from her dream. We still get to see a bit of that sassiness that's shown in the trial with her interaction with the executioner. But, like, it's not the same. Overall, this one was 
kind of meh in the realm of entertaining me, and it would have ranked a lot lower if not for the awesome effects. Like, people might poo-poo them now because we have things like 3D animation, but let's not forget that this was released in 1903. The earliest surviving movie that we have is from the 1880s, and it's like three seconds long, not even 20 years before this one came out. So them finding a way to do the effects and do them so seamlessly is just a So yeah, big boost for that. Big, big boost. We only have to jump ahead a few years, seven to be exact, for the last one on today's list. In 12th position, we have the 1910 version of Alice in Wonderland. Again, it's a shorty, 15 minutes, or one reel long, and again, I don't have a lot to say about it. But I must ask, Thomas Edison had a production studio? Okay then, I didn't know that before. It was super accurate, but they did this weird thing where they combined some of the hollow door stuff with some of the stuff at the White Rabbit's house. That was interesting. I mean, it was a very different way to go, and even now, after all this time, I'm not sure if I loved or hated it. It just, it was different. One thing I couldn't tell was when we reached the Queen of Hearts section, and she wanted the cards dead. Like, in the book, there was a logic to her as to why she wanted their heads off. I mean, it's a messed up logic. Okay, we get it. You like the color red, but damn, they're roses. Get a genus of roses. It's red and not a different color instead of freaking your staff out so much that they feel they need to paint them your preferred color. Like, fuck's sake. And yeah, again, it's a messed up logic, but for her, there's some sort of logic behind her calling for them to be executed. That's gone in this one. Though we do get to see Alice help them and get them to safety before the executioner can get to them. So that was awesome to see her rescue them, because that's another bit that's usually cut out, even when they include the queen calling for their heads to be chopped off. Despite what I just said, I found this one really entertaining. I can't explain why either, it just, it hit something in me that made me enjoy it, even though it did some weird shit. But even though it was entertaining, I can't say it was quite as good as the book. I mean, it was good. Just not as good. You get it? You feel me? Uh, speaking of versions that were as good as the book, that's what the focus of the next part of my Look at Alice movies will be focused on. But will any of them be better? That's the 126 pence question that will be answered in 11 possible things. Like I said, the plan for the Members Companion video is to take a look at one of the editing techniques used in filmmaking, because I want to know how they did the shrinking effect. So become a member so you can see it, because there's that and other exclusive content paired with past videos for you to check out. That's all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget, like and share, go and subscribe, sign up, be a member, go now today. Watch my madness, colorful charade, I have oh so much to say. Until next time, pals, blessed be. The format is simple. I tell you about what made the film versions do. <laughs> The format is simple. I tell you about what made the film versions great. <clears throat> what a break. This plate is all... This plate. Valifrey. I don't know what Valifrey is. The format is simple. I tell you about what the film versions do. Okay. Is an international entry. It, well, it's a food back Okay. I need to practice the check name for a sec. The format is simple. I tell you about what. Apparently, the format is simple, but me being able to say that is not. Let's finish this.